I thought we'd just talk about sort of four or five of the women that you that you that you talk about in the book. Uh, and there are twenty one, as the title says. How may, how did you choose these? How did you select them? Because um, there's actually quite a large number to choose from, I imagine. There is. There's a lot more than than I think people think there are. Um, uh, the I ended up with some very long lists of all the women that I could have included, um, and I had to um put some criteria on what I wanted for the women that I included so I knew that I wanted I knew that I wanted to do a big span of history I wanted it to be kind of beginning to end so I've chosen the semi-arbitrary point of 476 as the cutoff as the like if there's not an emperor in Rome I've decided that's not the Roman Empire anymore so um that was my cutoff but I knew I wanted to go from the foundation through to um an end point uh, and I knew that I didn't want it to just be empresses I didn't want it to be queens I didn't want it to be entirely women from this very small um cabal of families these kind of billionaire royal families who don't tell us much about the empire as a whole they just tell us about what it's like to be rich in one city um incredibly rich the riches is sort of beyond the dreams of avarice um you, you're saying they're, they're yeah. all want to Bezos level really yeah basically it's like if you a lot of the time when you're reading the history of the late republic or something you are reading the history of the Elon Musks and Jeff Bezos and the kind of people who can afford to go into space for fun rather than like average people and their experiences so I definitely wanted normal people and what like and uh, some normal lives in the empire um which helped me to kind of see where I was doing too many empresses or where there were kind of overlaps in stories that I wanted to cut out um, or where I had too many in that Julio-Claudian period. Um, but it was tough work cutting out some of them. There are some that, uh, that left the draft with a heavy heart. <laughs> um, but in the end, I knew that I wanted it to be, I wanted to include as much of the Eastern Empire as I could so it wasn't just Western Sorry, Europe. The, the, the Eastern Empire meaning... Meaning uh, kind of the east of the Mediterranean, really. So okay. Egypt, Syria, Turkey, well, that area now, um, yeah. rather than because I think find a lot of the time when we think of the Roman Empire, we're thinking about Western Europe and don't think about those kind of the fact that it encompassed the whole Mediterranean and all that that encompasses. And North um, Africa. As well. and north africa as well um so i wanted people from all over uh and i wanted to um show some diverse stories as well like so uh not just the rich but people who work people who are i suppose the closest thing you've got to a bourgeoisie kind of equestrian families and uh or families who never touched rome in their entire lives but were still roman so um that was generally my criteria as I was picking and choosing and also I had to be able to write more than two sentences about them because there are some <laughs> that I could have written two amazing sentences about but it would have been a struggle to say any more than that and there's quite a lot of material about them uh they they had their biographers at the time or soon after yes yeah um so there's um there's lots that you have um the material about once you kind of step outside of the the classic sources really now, um, I've got four, would like, uh, or maybe five, because Mac Mark mentioned um, Gala Placidia, Gala Placidia, uh, who is the last person in your book, because he um, coincides with the sort of uh, fall of the Roman Empire, I suppose. Um, but let's start with this woman, Turia, um, who, uh, well, if anyone's been watching this sort of like rather average documentary on Netflix about Caesar, she <laughs> <laughs> she was living through all that stuff, wasn't she? Caesar versus Pompey and so on. Yeah, um, that's the exact point that she is living. Um, there, so we know about her because there is this enormous, um, or at one point there was an enormous epitaph put up to her by her husband who loved her completely. We don't actually know what her name was. We call her Turia because in the 19th century, somebody thought that her story sounded similar to a story in a book. Um, I was like, close enough, we'll call her Turia. But her, the bit that has her name on it is absent. Um, it's lost forever, unfortunately. Um, but we call her Turia uh, and her husband um, 
put up these two big monoliths, basically. They're each about eight foot high um, on the Via Appia when she died, uh, talking about her life and basically how incredible she was and how she survived through two sets of civil wars. So they lived through the wars between Pompey and Caesar and then through the uh, second triumvirate and the wars between Antony and Octavian and Lepidus. Um, and... <laughs> Turia's husband, God bless him, uh, chose the wrong side in every war. Uh, he was on Pompey's side when Caesar invaded Rome um, and lost, and she had to intervene in order to get him back into Rome safely. Um, this is after she has her parents are murdered, uh, and she single handedly prosecutes the murderers. She also fights off um, a, a lawsuit which attempts to. Uh, basically adopt her into a family so they can steal all of her money, which she just causes so much of a fuss that they have to back off because she's too difficult to adopt. Um, and uh, Milo's, the followers of Milo, who is an exile from Rome, um, try to steal her house and she physically fights them off. And, uh, <laughs> and all of that is happening during the First Civil War. She then intervenes with Julius Caesar to get her husband back to Rome safely. At which point he immediately chooses the wrong side again um, and then ends up being prescribed by the second triumvirate. So they publish this list of names um, of people that you can legally kill and take all of their stuff. Uh, he's on that list and she intervenes first with Octavian um, to get him removed from the list. She hides him from the bands of people who were uh, attempting to murder people for their money. And um, when Lepidus refuses to acknowledge that Octavian has removed him from the list, she causes quite an amazing public scene. She goes to the forum in Rome and throws herself on the ground and screams um, and begs him and causes such a uh, such a scene that he is embarrassed into agreeing with her, essentially. Um, he has her beaten, but she still doesn't stop. And um, she therefore saves her husband for a second time and all of this she does probably before she's 30. Um, like most of it happens before she's 25, but she's very young while she is doing this. Um, and she's just very clearly this, this woman that awes her husband with her bravery and with her dedication to him and to their marriage and the fact that she there's no, kind of no length that she won't go to to protect them, um, despite the fact that they fundamentally disagree with Octavian and everything that they stand for. But they manage to get themselves back into the good graces. They're very, very rich, elite people. There's a possibility that her husband is a consul at some point. Um, but they then go on to have... Um, a very long marriage they're married for 43 years uh, but they never have children because they are infertile and the second half of the um, the story that he put up about her is about the infertility uh, troubles that they have how hard she tries to become pregnant and then when she can't she comes to him with this proposal that she will divorce him so that he can marry a woman that she will find that will give him the heirs that he deserves um but she will stay in the house and they will keep their property together um, and she will be like a sister-in-law so they'll still be together but not legally quite where she thinks she's finding this woman who will agree to this is <laughs> unstated never happens <laughs> it doesn't because he is so devastated that she would suggest this and he loves her oh, so much yeah he he says he gets quite angry that he's like i could never like after all that you've done for me after everything that we've been through together i could never um i could never betray us like that basically and he refuses to let her do this and says it would be almost offensive to him that he would to think that he would put her aside just for the sake of children and he basically says that like i want you more than i want children which is very romantic comedy and lovely um and they have this marriage and he talks about how she's this great advisor and she takes in women from their family and raises them right and finds some good husbands and gives them dowries and that's what she dedicates her life to and to kind of managing their property which are almost certainly immense um and then she dies after they've been married for 43 years and he is absolutely bereft and the last couple of paragraphs are just him saying without you i've lost my peace i've lost my security i'm 
assailed by grief and by fear and I cannot stay firm against either of them and I should have given you everything you deserved everything but it was not in my ability to give it to you and I wish that I had died first and it's very emotional um but it's just such a beautiful picture of two people who who love each other very much and who are willing to sacrifice quite a lot for one another that you really see very little of in the ancient world especially among that level of elite family um where marriage is usually presented as something that was contracted for um for family reasons and that had no feeling in it and um if you see pictures of like elite marriages it's always just them shaking hands so it looks really business like <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but there actually is this kind of this this swell of emotion in these mar in some marriages that you rarely get to see and so it's a lovely story of a woman who she's very conservative and there's a lot of, there's a surprising amount in it about their property management and about how they have a what's called a manus marriage where she gives over the management of her property to him um and so they're the exact kind of marriage that from a legal perspective looks really cold and like she has no power but actually he is completely devoted to her and she has quite a lot of agency in the world and she is talking to high level the highest level pol political actors and shaping the the way that politics is uh, affects their lives and so it's a really beautiful story it's a miracle that it survived in the, the fragments that it did survive but it's lovely now that's a more general point Gemma isn't it in the book that um these women that you're talking about do have a lot of agency in fact um whereas you know legally women didn't have many powers could you yeah. just explain what sort of powers they did or didn't have um in in general or how those might have varied so legally um officially women are uh, for the most part perpetually minors in Roman law so they're not um legally allowed to make wills by themselves or um sell uh land they can sell small property but they can't sell um land or big property uh, by themselves they have to have a guardian who is could be a father or husband is sometimes somebody who is kind of given to them by the praetor so uh, very famously cicero left his wife terentia for a girl that he was the guardian of so he'd been assigned to her as a guardian she turned out to be very rich and wouldn't you know it <laughs> he fell in love with her um, <laughs> um and so technically women um, have this, uh, are in this guardianship situation where they have to have a man officially sign things. They wouldn't be allowed to, you know, buy cigarettes in the modern world. Um, so that is the official position, but there is always wiggle room within that. And you can see this, that if they have a guardian who um, completely thinks that they're brilliant and that they only have the best ideas in the entire world then they can do what they like and their husband will sign off on it but it also always puts in the position where if their guardian doesn't think that they're the best thing in the entire world or if their guardian wants to enact power over them or if they're just absent then um it curtails their ability to do things quite a lot um but this only really applies to people who own land um like if you have don't have enough to be making wills or um selling enormous estates in southern Italy um or worrying about who is in your insulae that you own, then it's not something that necessarily applies to you that much. Um, because a lot of people in the Roman Empire don't own land and don't own um enough to be giving away in formal wills. It is very much something that is of more importance to the rich than it is to the poor. Um there are also questions about how far it or how much women can wiggle around it because one of the women that I have in the book is Julia Felix, who definitely owned property in Pompeii. Um, and there's no name, no suggestion that as far as we can tell that she has a guardian um, or at least she's not naming her guardian anywhere. Um, but uh, so it might be that this is something that mostly only applies to the very very rich um or she has a guardian and just nobody can be bothered to mention him because he's useless <laughs> and Hugh, julia felix was a um sort of successful businesswoman wasn't she she she, she ran yeah. a, um well a bar was it called the venus bath uh, yes so she has a like it's an entire complex um, it, it's like a sort of um well, like a sort of sports center is it somebody go and have a <laughs> and, like just hang out there yeah I keep referring it to it as the Odyssey. 
Yeah. It's like yeah. Westfield in West London. Exactly. Like, it's, it's somewhere, it's like, now it's like the place where you go for a meal, you go to the cinema, you go for a swimming pool, <laughs> whatever. It's like a leisure centre. But it's got yeah. a bath, so it's got a hot food bar, it's got gardens that you can walk around in, it's got a little shrine. Um, and it's also got a little, uh, it's got shops in it um, and apartments. Uh, and it's also got um, a little restaurant, like where you could go and have some formal dining. But it is, um, it's two uh, like houses that were knocked together and expanded. So, um, and it, yeah, it's a whole kind of leisure complex, basically, where you can go for an evening out um, and it's lovely. But um, we only know that it belonged to Julia Felix because it, uh, at the time when Vesuvius erupted and uh, it was buried in ash, it had uh, it was up for rent and she had painted on the outside, literally for rent, uh, the estate of Julia, um, Julia Felix, daughter of Spurious, uh, for a period of five years. And it includes these baths, these well-appointed baths and uh, flats and gardens and uh, hot food and shops and inquire within basically and from that you can see that it is uh, uh, the kind of kind of leisure space that we didn't really know existed it just looked like a real weird house until <laughs> um, until you found that uh, that sign outside which explained what it was. Now let's move on to um, the less worldly people that Mark was talking about we've got um uh, well, there's, there's a few Christians, but St. Vibia Perpetua, yeah. or Perpetua um, was a Christian martyr in Carthage who has a quite a horrifying story. She does, um, but uh, it's a fascinating story because she is one of the very few women that we have who um, wrote her own story. Um, it has definitely come down to us in edited form, but she... Uh, she was arrested when she was about 22 in Carthage um, and it, it, she is described as a woman who is well-educated, noble, married and with a son that she is still breastfeeding. Um, uh, but she's also a Christian catcherman um, who somehow has ended up being arrested for being a Christian. Um, and she is arrested and imprisoned and then tried and then executed. So if you can hear weird noises, it's my cat playing with a toy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really the screen wobbles slightly. I can't hear. I yeah. can't hear the cat. <laughs> that what, is my what, cat. Tell us what your cat's name is. Is it called, you know, Perpetua or something like that? She's called Livia, so she's also got a good Roman name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she's having a really good time behind the laptop. Um, but yeah, but Perpetua, <laughs> um, she's arrested. She is uh, imprisoned, and she, when she's in prison, she um bribes a guard so that she can be given a pen and paper so she can write her story uh and she writes about her she spends a couple of weeks in prison um and she writes about her trial um but also her experience of being a woman with a child in prison um and she hates being away from her child and she suffers very badly when she's not um, not with her son because she's breastfeeding him and she doesn't know whether he's eating. Um, but she also suffers very badly when her son is in prison with her because prison is horrible and she's pretty clear that prison is a miserable place to be. It's dark, it's smelly, it's there's no windows, it's uncomfortable. Um, and so uh, she is very anxious about that. Um, and she's also very unhappy about the fact that her basically her decision to um to go through with this process of being martyred is having an impact on her family so particularly her father who in a very nice twist on what usually happens in ancient sources is never named he's a very big character but she just calls him my father normally you get women who are just around not getting named but here we get the names of all the women and not the men <laughs> um, <laughs> um but she's very unhappy about it but um and her way of dealing with it is prayer and um what she considers to be miracles so she um her son is taken away from her after her trial and she prays and prays until her um her breast milk dries up and her child is miraculously weaned uh, so he will now start eating solid food um and she can stop suffering both her worry that her child is going to starve to death and also the pain that she has um, which you never hear about in any other source, which is the pain of uh, having full breasts as a weaning mother, <laughs> um, which is something that a lot of women experience but never gets written about. Um, but she also writes about 
these prophetic dreams that she has. She has dreams about her brother who has died before her and she prays that he has a better afterlife. Um, and she also has dreams uh, which she considers to be messages from God that she is doing the right thing. So she has a dream that she climbs a ladder of swords there and sees um, God um, milking lambs and he basically tells her that she's doing the right thing and then she has a dream that she um, is sent into the arena to fight uh, an Egyptian uh, athlete, an Egyptian gladiator um, who she very rudely describes as very ugly uh, And um, but she is uh, helped in that with her by God who gives her literally a boost up so that she can win the fight and she interprets this as she is doing that she is doing the right thing because at any point she can say I'm not a Christian I've changed my mind I convert I will sacrifice to the emperor um and that's what the trial is it's them saying are you sure you're Christian and they say yes I am yes I am yes I am and they try really hard um to not martyr these people but um the the Christian thought at the time is that martyrdom is is the best way to heaven um and so she is effectively choosing to to go through with this and to be executed um and the her narrative breaks off when um on the last day before she is sent into the ar arena uh and she... the arena there, there was something like thirty thousand people watching this yeah month. yeah so it's a it's a special games as well because it's a game to the birthday of one of the emperors at the time who's the emperor gator so we can um pretty precisely date it to 193 and um she uh, so there's everybody's there it's a big public holiday and uh, somebody else a man writes the description of what happens to her and it's very different um if you read it all of a sudden she is this great hero who is not afraid of anything and is only concerned with her modesty rather than a woman who is afraid and looking for reassurance but um she is sent out in order to mock her and her companion Felicitas who is also sainted um, she's sent out to fight a female cow which the Roman authorities in Carthage apparently think is very very funny and nobody else does uh, and she is um, kind of trampled by a cow for a while until everybody gets bored and then uh, she and her fellow Christians are uh, unusually executed in the arena rather than being kind of taken backstage and what would normally happen is the person being executed kind of being sent to the beast gets mauled a bit by whatever beast they've been given um and they get bloodied and it's kind of like they got thrown about or just bitten a bit um i'm very blasé about this because i've written a whole book about murder but it's very horrible um but the um and then they're taken off and finished off basically um at off off screen off stage um but the uh, the Carthaginian people apparently were very keen to see these these um, these Christians die properly, and so they're brought out and their throats are cut um, on on the arena floor in front of everybody. Um, and the Christian community in Carthage by this point was already secure enough that um, her brothers and sisters in the community took their bodies, buried them where now there is a big church. Um, it became the Basilica in Carthage. Um, and every year they read her diary aloud um, to remember her, basically, and to remember the uh, these kind of very early um very vocal christians and um so she became a very important saint in the north african church but she from the perspective of, of the kind of not church people she's very very important as one of the very few women whose voices were allowed to carry on beyond just their own lifetime because obviously women did write um it's just that they were never preserved but the circumstances of her life and death meant that her voice got preserved and we get to know that women really did care about their children, a question that people have genuinely asked about the ancient people. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and and she showed this amazing fortitude and bravery. As Mark said, it was a sort of um, uh, a new, new kind of a freedom, freedom that was being expressed. And I guess for you the questions, because um, we're, 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 we're ripping through our <laughs> <laughs> It's absolutely fascinating. Thanks so much, Emma. But um, can we maybe talk a little bit about Melania before we um, go to questions, Victoria? Because... Um, that relates to what Mark was talking about at the beginning, because she actually, uh, I guess looking at my notes that I took from, from when I was reading, but she she's involved in, uh, she went to meet St. Anthony, who was one of the Desert Fathers, um, 
and uh, there's a, I think it, is that the same Saint Anthony who's in the painting The Temptation of Saint Anthony. Yes, so, so he managed to live for a hundred like, years. <laughs> he, he sort of uh, heroically gives up shagging. Yeah, he did. Uh, he, he wants to go and visit him <laughs> in the desert uh, and sort of like you know get a bit close to this guru. Yeah, so Honestly, she, yeah. yeah, so she's um she's actually a very very rich um elite Roman woman. So she is uh, alive in the fifth century. Um, no, fourth century. Sorry. Um, and just like after Christianity is legalized, Christianity has become the uh the religion of the upper classes the imperial religion the official religion and so she is a much um later version of what female devotion can look like but also um a very different version of what emancipation can look like because she she does her duty basically she gets married she has children she makes sure that her son has a good career in rome and then she quits everything and goes to egypt um in order to hang out with the desert fathers and mothers um who started with saint anthony who literally just walked out one day and went to live in the desert by himself and give up everything um but un unfortunately for him uh, other people thought that was really cool um, and a problem that a lot of desert fathers and mothers had is that they tried to they were trying to live lives of solitude and quiet reflection and aestheticism got crowds <laughs> of people yeah, yeah. Yeah. people kept following him everywhere he went being like teach me your ways and he'd be like no <laughs> no um, and he spent genuinely he lived until he was 100 um but uh, about 80 years of that was him attempting to get further and further into the desert while people tried to become his disciples <laughs> and melania uh, was one of them and she kind of she went round um, and visited lots of them she eventually decided that living in a cave in egypt wasn't what she wanted to do because she did actually quite like being very rich and people loving her um and she ended up going to jerusalem where she built a nunnery um, and became a very, very important patron um, and a very important theologian. She was very involved in what's called the Originist controversy um, in the uh, late fourth century. And um, uh, she uh, was eventually so powerful that on her final trip back to Rome, she was allowed to take a bit of the Holy Cross, the true cross with her as a present for her uncle, um, which is um, <laughs> one way of demonstrating that you are very, very beloved by the highest authorities in the church. <laughs> um, but she she dedicated herself to this kind of aestheticism that um, only really works if it's a choice whereby she stopped washing and kind of wore hair clothes and um, wouldn't sleep in a bed and spent a lot of time berating other people for washing their hands. And um, it's, a, it's the kind of thing that looks really amazing if you're a very rich woman who's chosen to do this and looks significantly less amazing if you're just a homeless person. Um, but she enjoyed a lot of prestige from it. Um, and she was able through the church to gather a lot of power um, and a lot of uh, a lot of prestige from patronage and from a real devotion to her uh, her faith. Um, although she heartily tried to stop her daughter Melania, her daughter, her granddaughter Melania the Younger, um, from becoming aesthetic, uh, she did want her family to continue, and so she is this interesting kind of intermediary stage almost of her people who want to keep getting rich off of the properties that she has and wants her family name to continue but also very much wants personally to be an aesthetic woman and to devote herself to um to christ uh so she has she has an interesting life 